you have a Bible this morning, open up to 1 Thessalonians. If you don't have a Bible this morning, there is a pew Bible there in front of you. And you can find Thessalonians on page 159. Uniquely in those Bibles, if you pick up a New American Standard Bible, which most of them are, there are two page 159s. So there's one in the back and one in the front. So there it goes through the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the Bible, New Testament. Uh, so you're looking for the second 159, the, the New Testament, closer to the back part of the Bible. Uh, we would also say this morning, if you're a guest or um, if you're here visiting with us and you don't have a Bible and you want to read God's Word, please take one of those uh, as, a, as a, a gift from us. We would love for you to, to read it and hopefully experience life change like we've experienced life change here through the Word of God. And so, so thankful that you guys are here this morning, excited about a new year, excited about uh, walking through 1 Thessalonians together. And so we're going to jump into that today. As, as I was uh, obviously getting ready to preach and thinking about, um, you know, the passage this morning and was thinking about uh, the Christmas gifts and how I can remember, uh, my, my kids are getting a little bit older, but I can remember particularly my first kids, uh, particularly we would get gifts around Christmas and, and usually they required a lot of work, all right? Before the kids had fun with them, someone had to put them together, right? And if you had family like mine who really enjoyed to torture you, they would give you gifts that they knew that would take you a lot of work, right? It's like, hey, dad's going to have fun putting this one together, right? Like, yeah, thanks. We'll leave it at your house. You can put it together and they can play with it here, you know? So I can remember, and I remember opening up these instructions. Most of the time, you're looking at them. Some of you may have experienced this over Christmas. You remember, you open them, and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. How am I going to put this bouncy horse thing together? Like, you see the picture, you know, you see the picture on the box, and you're like, man, that would be great if we could get to there. And then you open it up, and there's all of these pieces here, and you're like, I'm not sure what to do. And, and the men in us may take a while for us to get to the, you know, to the instructions, right? I can do this. And you start pulling out the parts, and you're like, I, I can't do this. I need some help. And I, I was just reminded over the holidays, and, and as we've been putting things together as our kids have gotten older, of the beauty of the internet. And I mean, they had the internet when my kids were younger, but it wasn't the internet that it is today, and we didn't have the 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 beautiful thing called YouTube, right? And this works for anything in YouTube, almost anything. I'm convinced you can find pretty much anything on YouTube. If you've got to change the engine out in your car, you can go get on YouTube, and somebody has videoed themselves changing changing out an engine on the car or something. If you, you got these toys for Christmas, you're figuring out how to put them together, chances are really good. If you're stuck, or right, if you're still, you know, three weeks out, and you still have some gifts that your kids are saying, Dad, Mom, put this together, and you still have not because you have no idea what to do, go to YouTube. It, it will change you, right? You can just YouTube it in there, and I promise you it's probably in there, all right? If it's not, go ask Kurt. Kurt can put things together. He's great at building things. He'll great, he's great with that. As, as this text this morning that we're, gonna, that we're diving into is really about how needing, needing help to put things together, needing help to follow Christ and really how much better it is. And we can get the written instructions. You can give me written instructions and that's good and that's helpful and I can do my best to read the instructions and figure out which screw is screw A and which screw is screw B and which screw is screw C, even though they all look the same to me. I can, you know, maybe try to figure that out. But it's so much better when you have a visual when you can see it in action, you can actually see someone putting something together. This is what this is, and this is what this part is, and these things go together. How much better it is in our Christian faith when we have people that come alongside us and say, hey, let me show you how to walk with Christ. And that's the essence of our text this morning. We're going to jump in in 1 Thessalonians, do a little bit of a background, and then really jump into the heart of the text this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. So immediately we begin, we open up the letter, and we are told who 
The authors are Paul and Sylvanus. Sylvanus is, is, is also called Silas. So when you read the New Testament, you hear about Paul and Silas and Timothy, and these are the guys who are writing the letter, primarily Paul, and he includes Silas and Timothy because they've been a part of the church of Thessalonica. And so he includes them because they're with him when he writes the letter. But Paul is the, the primary author here of, of the letter. And, and we understand that he's writing to the Thessalonians. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica. And there's some things about the city of Thessalonica that would be good for us to understand and, and, and know this morning as we continue to walk through uh, the book. But this is a capital city. Of, of one of the provinces there, a province called Macedonia. It's a city on the port. Uh, and so if, if you looked at a map today, you would have Turkey, uh, you know, kind of sticking out in, into the Mediterranean. And then you have the, the other land coming down, and that's modern-day Greece. And it's right there, right where the two almost intersect. They're not re- very far apart. And this would, this would have been a place where there was lots of commerce, lots of ships coming in, but there's also a really important roadway that works its way through the coast and, and down and comes right through the city. And so there would be lots of commerce, lots of trade, lots of people coming and going. This was a hustling and bustling city. There was probably somewhere around 200 thousand people or so uh, scholars and people who studied have said it's about 200,000 people. It's very uh, cosmopolitan because of all the, inter- uh, not internet, they did not have internet. Because of all the, <laughs> because of, that would be incredible, because of all the, the interchanging that was happening with cultures and people uh, flowing through the region. It's just, it was just a happening place. And when I tried to think about, you know, what, what would we maybe compare it to? Maybe something like Houston. I know Houston has more than 200,000 people, but 200,000 people in this day and age was a lot of people. It's just, when you think about Houston, you think about a lot of different uh, ethnicities and, and a lot of commerce and ships and all of those things uh, coming in. It was, it was a city that was uh, very loyal to Caesar. It was, it was just a, a loyal it was, it was a stronghold of the empire, and um, they were very loyal to Caesar. And so you had the full array of gods as well. You had the full Roman gods. You had the full Greek gods. I mean, they, they were just, there was gods everywhere. It was a very pluralistic kind of a society with lots of, uh, lots of worshiping of different gods and a lot of people giving themselves to, to other gods and pagan gods. And there was, there was a little element of the Jewish uh, population there, we know that because there's a synagogue, and so there had to be at least some Jews there enough to, to have a synagogue. But by and large, there was not a lot of worship of the God of the Old Testament or particularly uh, Jesus. And so this is where you kind of find these guys coming into the scene. And so Paul and Timothy come to Thessalonica, and we read about that in Acts chapter 17, you can go read about that later. Uh, but basically what happens, Paul shows up to Thessalonica. He's on his journey, the second uh, missionary journey. He's working his way through, and he comes in there, and just like Paul normally does, he goes to the synagogue, and he preaches there uh, for a, a few weeks, and then he uh, probably is kind of kicked out of there. We know that because of what happens next in Acts uh, Acts 17. Um, a riot ensues. Basically, the Jews get upset because uh, Paul is here and he's preaching Jesus. And so the Jews don't like that. And so they incite this riot and they're staying with this guy named Jason. They come and get this guy, Jason. And it's, this is a big deal. And so they're not there very long. And really, they leave the city and they move on because things are turning bad quickly. But in the midst of that, some people are, are saved. Some people decide that they want to follow Jesus Christ, and so there's kind of this church that started there. Even We're not exactly sure quite how long they're there, but it wasn't a really long stay. probably wasn't a really long stay. It was long enough for a group of people to, to place their faith in Christ, come together, and have a little, a little church there. And so Paul moves on. He goes to the next city, and uh, he starts to get really concerned about Thessalonica and the people there and the new converts there just learning about following Jesus and how they had to move away so quickly. And so he sends Timothy back there, and then later on, Timothy comes back and meets him and gives him a report about the church in Thessalonica. And this is the letter that Paul writes back to them in response from what he hears about what is happening. And so 
Paul is concerned about these people. And as we read through the letter, you're going to hear a very friendly type of letter. It's a very encouraging letter to the people. There's lots of encouragement. There's, there's lots of just, hey, you know, keep on. Keep on doing what you're doing. And so he writes this letter to encourage the, the church in Thessalonica. And I'm really excited just personally as, you know, we're going to walk through this and, and the next, you know, three, three months or so, kind of getting through uh, the letter, I'm just excited to be encouraged by the Word of God. Now, let me tell you, there are some things that we're going to tackle that are going to push in a little bit. Today's going to push in a little bit. Because part of the issue is we see the encouragement of the Thessalonians and the things that they're doing good, and we've got to kind of look at those and go, okay, where are we at in that spectrum? And, and push in a little bit and ask some questions towards us and how we're living for the Lord. And, and remember, these, these, are, these are new believers, new converts. This church is, is pretty fresh and pretty new and still trying to figure out how to live in this pagan society, how to follow the Lord amidst, amidst all of these uh, temptations and struggles that are around them. And so Paul closes the greeting with kind of a normal greeting, grace to you and peace, uh, a normal greeting that you would greet people when you would write a letter during this time. So he starts in with a letter in in verse 2. We always thank God for all of you, remembering you constantly in our prayers. We recall in the presence of our God and Father your work of faith, labor of love, endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing your election, brothers, loved by God. So he starts in, he says, we are so thankful for you. I mean, could you imagine... Getting this letter, if you were the Thessalonians, and you had this dust up, right? This riot, things were crazy. Paul leaves, and now you get this letter back, and he's like, man, we are so proud of you. We're we're so thankful for you. When we pray, when we get in the presence of God, we're so thankful for you. We're so, man, we're just, we thank the Lord for you. And you get the sense of not just just because you exist, but because we've loved you, and we've known you, and there's been this relationship. Maybe during the Christmas season, Maybe you got a card or a letter from someone that was just a reminder of just their thankfulness for you being in their lives. I don't know about you, but even just getting a Christmas card for me, it's like, oh, they remembered me. They must care about me. They, they like me, you know, or whatever. And you get this Christmas card. It's, it's like that. The same kind of deal. These guys would think, man, this is Paul. Yeah, we remember he came through and, and he did some incredible things. He, he, he remembers us. He cares about us. It's going to pique your interest. You're going to go, okay, man, let's, let's, let's hear what, what Paul has to say. And he says, there are several things that we recall about you. There are several things that we're really, really thankful for when we think about you and what was happening while we were there. And he says these three things, the work of faith, the labor of love, and the endurance of hope. These, these three characteristics of the church, their faith, their love, and their hope, even In this short time and the things that they've heard about them, which we're going to get to in the the next part of this passage. And Paul is seeing them and seeing that they are faithfully living out the gospel. This is a work of faith. They are working this thing out. It's not just something that's kind of another thing, you know, another pot on the stove. No, this is it for them. They're working this thing out. They're trying to live by faith. They're trying to walk out this this Christian life, and and they're giving themselves to God. They're trying to be obedient and and follow the Lord and be faithful to the Lord. And then he says, your labor of love. And Paul understanding that this this love that they've given themselves to, both to God and I think both to God, this relationship with, with Paul and Timothy, that they're in this kind of love relationship together, that it's, they're laboring for this. Again, they're working. This is something, and they love God, and they're working out their, their own faith and their own uh, obedience and, and following the Lord and loving the Lord and their endurance of hope. And Paul knows that they're going through some difficult times. Are going through some difficult days. There's persecution. There was the riot in the city, and things, you know, were starting out really strong for them. And then when Paul left, things weren't looking very good. And when he gets this report, he says, "I'm so thankful that you guys are enduring. That you're hopeful. That you haven't given up. You still have hope. You still believe, and you're still enduring. You're still fighting the fight. You're still uh, living this this faith out." He says, "I'm so proud of you." And I just just can't help think about us and the world that we live in. I mean, we haven't really had any riots lately because, you know, I was preaching or anything like that. But 
I think all of us are living, those of us who have decided to follow Christ, we're living now in maybe a little bit more tension than we've lived in in the last few years. And we've certainly experienced and enjoyed a freedom that we have and that we still have. And I'm not going to say that this is the, the craziest time in all of history or anything like that. I mean, you read through the Bible, there's been some pretty crazy times. But I think when we think back just in our own culture, in the last five, maybe even ten years, there seems to be this growing sense of animosity towards Christians and towards people who want to live out their faith in the gospel. I just want us to hear God's words to us that if we will work out this faith and live out this labor of love and this endurance of hope, that just like Paul looks at these guys, God is looking at us and saying, man, I'm so thankful. Keep up the good work. Do this. Don't give up. I know you're in a difficult time. And maybe just personally for you. Maybe 2016 it was just a rough year for you. Maybe 2017 has started off not so great. Paul is saying, man, I'm so thankful for you. Keep up the good fight. Work out this faith, labor of love, endurance of hope. Be strong. Don't give up. He's so thankful that he's got to see this in them and hear this about them, and he understands that it's all because of Jesus Christ. We get that even, even more here. At the end of verse 4, he says, this, this hope that you have, this faith and love and hope that you have in Jesus Christ, because you're secure in your faith, this knowing your election, knowing that you are of God and that you are loved by God. That's similar to what we talked about last week. We want to be a people who live out our faith. We've got to understand that everything flows from a love that God has for us, a faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Again, we're not trying to earn his favor. We're not trying to earn his salvation. We're not trying to earn his grace and his mercy. No, we understand that living this faith and this love and this hope out in us is because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, because God loves us. He says, verse 5, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power in the Holy Spirit and with much assurance. You know what kind of men we were among you for your benefit, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, when in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, our gospel, we, we know when we came to you, we came to you and, and when we got to see the Spirit of God move, we came and we shared the gospel with you. We got to see the Spirit save people and rescue people, bring them from death to life. We saw the Holy Spirit move. We saw what God was doing and there was a lot of assurance in what was happening. When Paul left them, man, he knew because of what he had seen, how they had responded to the gospel, how the Holy Spirit had worked in them, he was assured that they were on the right path, that they had given their faith to Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, he says, you know what kind of men we were among you for your benefit, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Paul says, we came, we shared the gospel with you, but more than that, we shared our lives with you. He's going to say it later in chapter 2 is kind of his heart. In verse, chapter 2, verse 8, he says, We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. This, this is Paul's heart. He says, we've come to you and we've, we've, we've shared our lives with you. We've shared the gospel with you, but we also lived with you. We showed you what it was like to follow Christ, and then you became imitators of us and of the Lord. What Paul is saying is we follow the Lord. We came and brought you the gospel. We lived out our lives in the gospel. We shared the gospel. We loved each other. We were faithful. We showed you uh, how to read God's word, how to pray. All of these things that would be essential for following the Lord. That's what that Paul is saying. We've come and we've done this. We follow the Lord and now you are imitating us as we follow the Lord. Therefore, you're imitating the Lord. He says you've, you've imitated us. You've become imitators of us. And then he uses these words again. In spite of severe persecution, you welcome the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. You kind of get an echo here in verse 6 of verse 3. 
They became imitators. They, they worked out their faith even when he left. This labor of love, you get this idea of they, they were in this together. In spite of severe persecution, you clearly see this endurance of hope. They, they were enduring despite it being difficult, despite it, despite it being hard, and for them, severe persecution. They embraced the gospel. They welcomed the message with joy. And Paul is just so thankful for their lives. So thankful to see what God is doing in them. And so he goes on in verse 7, As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. Paul, again, just echoing and continuing on with why he's so thankful is because we came and we gave our lives to you and we're seeing the results. We're hearing the results of what God is doing in you. That we came to you. We shared the gospel with you. You became imitators of us. You started doing what we told you to do, how we showed you to follow the Lord. It says in there about the Lord's message rang out from you. You get this picture of this, at least for me, like this bell or, or a symbol, like just ringing out, the gospel just ringing out from their lives. They weren't hiding away, even in spite of the per persecution, they were living their lives faithfully for the gospel. And now as a result, they became an example to other believers. So you see Paul and Timothy following the Lord and then giving themselves to the, the church at Thessalonica and then seeing those people then give themselves to other people. And they're saying not only just those other people in, in that church, but all the people that are coming through. He says, he says they're not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. So the, the, either they're leaving or just the fact that people are coming and, and coming through their city. They're experiencing Christ when they come through the city. These guys are being an influence. They're being faithful. They're following the Lord. This is the essence of, of really all of Paul's ministry for me. It's the word that we use in church lingo. We call it discipleship. See, I, I, I think we like to talk about Paul being this great church planner, but I don't think Paul was mostly concerned, primarily concerned about just planting churches because there's something that happens before you can plant a church, you've got to make disciples. And Paul understood that if he would give himself, he would go to these cities and he would live amongst the people and he would share the gospel with them, but not just with his words, with his life. They got to not just watch the YouTube on video, they got to live it with this guy. And he, he would just, man, pour his life out to them in such a way that when they left, they could imitate him. But not only would they imitate him, and just do what he did in being right and being faithful and doing the right things, they would also take the gospel and let it ring out into others so that they could make disciples themselves. Now, Paul was replicating himself, knowing that if I do that, if I'll build disciples, then naturally, if I'll make disciples, if I'll be someone who makes disciples, who makes disciples, then these people will gather together and their love for the Lord will grow together and a church will be born. Discipleship is the name of the game. We think about the Great Commission. Jesus, at the end of Matthew 28, before he's getting ready to leave his disciples, he says, go and make disciples. He doesn't say go and plant churches, although that's great. Before you can do that, you've got to go make disciples and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And that's what Paul does. Though he's not there in that moment, he gets it later, right? He understands that his life, his primary concern is making disciples. It is the pool through which everything else, from which everything else flows. It's the foundation upon which everything else is built. And I want to tell you this morning, it is who we are as a church at Southside Baptist Church. When we think about loving Jesus and knowing truth and serving others and reaching people, it is all under the context of making and living as disciples for Jesus Christ. 
So when we have children's ministries and youth ministries and college student ministries and young adults and young marrieds and senior adults, everything has as its foundation the idea that we are here, God has left us here, God has called us to be a people who are going to make disciples. We are not here to build a bigger church or to be the biggest church in the city or to, to whatever else we might say we're going to be. We are here. God has placed us here at Southside Baptist Church to make disciples. We could gather five to 50 to 500,000 people in this place every week, but if our primary concern was not to make disciples, then we would have missed it. It's not about just gathering people to sing some songs and hear a sermon and go about our way. No, the church's existence is that we would be a people a group of people and individuals who say, I want to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Verse, end of verse 8, he says, Therefore, we don't need to say anything. For they, they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from the coming wrath. Paul says, we, there's nothing we can say. You guys get it. You're living out your faith. You're making disciples. You've decided to turn away from all of these other idols in your city and to serve the living God. I think when Paul has in mind this idea of serve the living God, he means you're actually serving the Lord, making disciples who make disciples. You're not just going through the rituals. You're not just going to church and doing the right things. This faith that you're living out is actually being lived out to make a difference in the lives of other people. These guys were committed to being a people who would make disciples. And hopefully if you've been around this church long enough, you've heard that word, you've heard that term, you've heard that idea. But I think some of us have gotten afraid of the word or the idea of making disciples because we've turned it into something really grandiose. Like you have to be, like you have to know every answer in the Bible. Like Tim, I would love to make disciples, but somebody's going to ask me about Leviticus chapter 17, verse 4, and I don't have any idea about how to answer that. I pulled that out of the top of my head, so don't go look at that. I don't know what it says. but <laughs> We have this fear that people are going to pull out these obscure questions, and we've got to know all of the answers. Like, I've got to be this, Tim, if you, man, I, I had a rough week this week. I yelled at my wife. I yelled at my kids. Well, you, you know, join the club, right? Like, none of us have got this thing all figured out. If we're waiting to be the perfect Christian, then we're going to wait for a long time. And if we're only going to let the perfect Christians make disciples, then no disciples are going to be made because there are no perfect Christians. These guys haven't been Christians very long at all. These guys are the perfect example. You say, Tim, I'm just really young in my faith. So are these guys. You know what it's like to follow the Lord for six months and show somebody who's only following the Lord for two months how to do it for six months. We have so many needs in this church, and I think we miss the idea of what is happening in this church sometimes. And maybe if we don't miss it, I just want to be clear about what it is. So when we ask, you say, man, we need some help over in our children's area. And we got some babies and two-year-olds and three-year-olds. We need some help. I think some of you here, that means I'm going to have to change diapers, and I don't really want to change diapers. Or you think... And those are kids. It's going to be crazy. I don't know how to teach kids. I can't, I can te I can't teach kids. I can, I can barely be with my own kids, right? Or, I mean, like, other kids, it's going to freak me out. Man, we need some help in the youth. We need some help with college students. We need Sunday school teachers. We need discipleship leaders and teachers. And what we need are people who say, you know, Jesus Christ has changed me. Jesus Christ has came in. And this is what he says about them. Serve the living and true God to wait for his son from heaven who whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is what Jesus Christ has done for you. 
He was raised from the dead. And Jesus Christ came and he gave his life for you. He gave his life to be the example, yes, but to also give your life so that you could be made right with God again. And we have sin. We're all sinners. And Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross so that you and I don't have to take the punishment of our sin. But Jesus took the punishment of our sin so that now we can place our faith in Jesus. And when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of God in us. God, in his mercy and his grace, sends Jesus and he rescues us out of our sin. Those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, this is what has happened. We were desperate. We were needy. The Bible says we were the enemy of God, but yet God had love and compassion and mercy on us, and he rescues us. He rescues us from the coming wrath, and this is one of the hard parts. He uses the term, the coming wrath. I think sometimes that's difficult for us to wrap our minds around. The Bible teaches that for those that do not place their faith in Jesus Christ, there is a coming wrath. Part of our gospel, yes, Jesus Christ loves us and there's grace and there's mercy and there's salvation for those that believe, but we cannot miss the other side that says if you do not believe, it's, you will not die in just going to nothingness. The Bible teaches that what is awaiting is the wrath of God. And what God wants us to do as his followers is help people understand what it means to follow Jesus, what it means for what Jesus has done and how they can faithfully follow him. So they will not experience the coming wrath of God. So when we say we need help in the nursery or the college or the youth or all parts of our church, we're not asking you have to be the perfectly qualified person. We're not even asking that you have to teach changing diapers and wiping noses. That's discipleship. Just being in there and loving on children or loving on youth or college students or other people in our church, that's an element of discipleship. It's walking alongside people and saying, yes, I follow Christ. I believe in Jesus and I'm living my life in such a way. You come alongside me and you can watch and you can learn. Maybe I don't have all the answers. But I can love people and I can serve people. In verse 5, Paul uses this phrase that just I keep rolling over in my head when I think about us as disciple makers. He says, you know what kind of men we were among you for your benefit. See, the church is not primarily a consumeristic place. We don't come in here primarily thinking every week, God, do something for me. God, do something for me. God, do something for me. Yes, we know that God will hopefully teach us and shape us and serve us. But hopefully, even coupled with that, more so than that, as we're coming into this place saying, God, what can I give? How can I be a benefit? We talked last week about making a difference this year. New Year's resolutions are great, but maybe a New Year's resolution that says, I want to be a person who makes a difference for the glory of God this year. I can think of no better way for us to do that than to say, I want to be a person who's going to make disciples. I want to share the gospel to bring people into following Christ. I want to help those people who said, yes, I want to follow Christ, to know how to follow Christ more and follow Christ better and be more faithful. Think of no better way to make a difference than to say, I want to be a benefit to others. I want to disciple someone else. I know I don't have it all figured out. I know I've got my own problems. I've got my own planks in my eye. But I know that God's word says that those people who have been changed, those people who have been rescued from him, This is the natural response for us. How selfish will it be for us to take the mercy and the grace and the salvation from the wrath of God that we have received and just keep it to ourselves? God wants you. He wants to use you to make a difference this year. He wants to use you to help disciple someone. And maybe that's in a really formal way. Maybe you're like, I'm going to grab this person and I want to walk with them for a little while and help them follow Jesus Christ. 
that would be great. But maybe it's also, it's that and maybe it's just serving and being a benefit in this place. It's giving your talents and giving your gifts. I said, Tim, I don't have any gifts or talents. You can pass out a bulletin. Not that that's on the bottom of the totem pole. We love the people who pass out bulletins. But it doesn't take a lot to pass out a bulletin. It doesn't take a lot to change a diaper. It doesn't take a whole lot to sit around a group of table with the college students and just say, I love you, I care about you, I'm praying for you. It doesn't take a lot to go up in the youth and just be there and hang in. You don't have to be the teacher. You don't have to be the one that has all the answers. Our youth's having their D now this weekend. They still need two homes. Jamie would love for you to come find him after the service because he doesn't want all those kids sleeping in his house this weekend. You can be a disciple maker just by opening up your home and for a, just a short 24, 48-hour kind of deal, ex- express the love of Jesus Christ to some junior high kids or some high school kids just by opening your home. You know what they're going to think? Man, these people, how nice of them to let me come and be very good with their furniture and take care of their house in a great way. (laughs) Leave it better than I left it. Right, guys? They'll love you. How can you be a benefit to others in this church, on your street, in your workplace? And we have a decision that we have to make this morning. For some of us, The decision this morning is to step in and being a disciple. Maybe this morning you've not made the decision to follow Jesus Christ and we're talking about the wrath of God that is coming and you're like, man, I need some answers for that. I've got some questions. We would love to talk to you. For those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we've got the question. We've got a decision to make for this year. Are you going to be somebody who lives for the benefit of others, who wants to be a disciple, who makes disciples, who helps make other disciples? Or are you going to continue to just be selfish with your faith? Listen, I know we've all got places to grow and areas to grow in. But this is who God has asked us to be as a church, not just our church, but all churches. We are to be a people who make disciples. We teach people about the love of Christ so that they can know Christ. And for those of us that do know Christ, we help each other. We disciple each other. We grow together and walk in faith and love and hope together. See, this is so important. I love this about the Thessalonian church and that we need each other. This discipleship is the idea. We've got to have each other because these are difficult times. And maybe not as difficult as they lived in, but we are a people who are sojourning through this world. This is not our home. So even the easiest of eras, even the easiest of generations, it's still difficult. There's still sin. There's still idols. There's still temptations. And we need brothers and sisters to come along and say, let me show you. Let me help you follow Jesus Christ. Let's be that kind of a church. Let's be that kind of a church that wants to benefit each other and comes in this place and says, how can I be a benefit to my brothers and sisters?